Welcome to Past and Precedent, a show where we take the hottest debates of today and show that they were also the hottest debates of yesterday. Today's case, the 1965 case of Griswold v Connecticut. Do states have the right to ban the use of contraceptives? Ooh, spicy. Now back in the day, Connecticut had a law in the books that, well, simply put, prohibited the use of contraceptives or aiding, abetting, or consulting someone on using those contraceptives. Talk about an out of the box excuse for not wearing a condom. But baby, the state of Connecticut says we can't. Now, as you can imagine, not everyone was so pleased with this rule, which is where the legal controversy of today really began. Now, this case had two main questions behind it. First, who has the right to sue the state of Connecticut? And second, uh, where in the Constitution does it say you have a right to contraception? On what grounds are you even challenging this law? And now to fully examine this case, we gotta start with the prequel to Griswold v Connecticut, Poe v Ullman. Now the Poes were a married couple who sought medical advice on how to use medical devices for the protection of their health. In this case, those devices happen to be contraceptives. But a physician was deterred, remember that deterred word is going to come back in a second to sink this entire case, from giving such advice because the state's attorney intended to prosecute offenses against the state's laws and he claimed that the giving of such advice and the use of such devices was forbidden by state statutes. <sighs> Try saying that three times fast. Now the question facing the court in this case was, does a law deterring physicians from performing a duty rise to the level of damages that make this case relevant to the court? More simply put, can a state give established businesses and professionals the classic parent treatment? I wouldn't do that if I were you. Now I'm going to count down from five and what am I going to do when I get to zero? Well, we wouldn't want to find out, would we? Now in the end, the appeals were dismissed because the records in these cases did not present controversies justifying the adjudication of the constitutional issue. You gotta break the law, get prosecuted, and incur damages in order to have standing, according to the court. Now, seeing this ruling, two physicians decided to, do, well, let the state governments count down to zero and then see what happened. Estelle Griswold, the executive director of Planned Parenthood's League of Connecticut, and Dr. C. Lee Burkston, doctor and professional at Yale Medical School, were arrested and found guilty as accessories to providing illegal contraception. Well, now that we're actively arresting people for abetting in the distribution of contraception, this whole lack of standing argument kind of flew out the window. I think we're gonna have to hear them out. Now enter the title case of this episode, Griswold v Connecticut. The arguments in this case really represent the most fundamental differences in beliefs between conservatives and liberal justices in their legal interpretations. You see, the conservative justices argued, hey man, I just ran a search for contraception rights on the entire constitution and amendments, and guess what? It's not a right we gave people. It's not in the laundry list of rights, so states can infringe on that potential right. Now, liberals, on the other hand, argued, hey man, it's a free country. Americans have implicit rights to privacy in their own lives to do things like use contraceptives. State governments should not be able to regulate the private lives of their citizens. It gotta read between the lines a little bit, but it's kind of there. The million dollar question in this case was could the court create a new right where there wasn't explicitly one enshrined beforehand? In this case, we need to take a step back though because the right in question was not a right to contraception specifically. To this day, each state has their own slate of restrictions on the sale of contraception. It was instead a fight about the citizens' right to just sort of do stuff they wanted to do without the state government breathing down their necks, also known as the right to privacy. The court overturned the contraception ban because they found a zone of privacy was created by several fundamental constitutional guarantees. 
Now then, 7-2 majority of justices will see an implicit rights to privacy pop up all over the Constitution. First Amendment, Third Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, huh, maybe there's one on the back too. So first, the First Amendment, because well, that implicitly included the right to freedom of privacy and associations. In this case, you only need birth control if there's some associating going on. Catch my drift? Third Amendment, the one that says soldiers can't crash on your couch during a time of peace, well, that implies privacy of home. Most of the associating that would be going on requiring the use of birth control happens in a home. If it doesn't, there are indecent exposure laws to take care of it. Now to the Fourth Amendment, no undue search and seizures. Do I even have to explain how this one relates? Privacy of person and possessions. Especially don't go poking around asking whether I'm using protection or not. And finally, the Fifth Amendment, the right to remain silent. Now that might seem a little weird at first, but that's the textbook right to privacy of personal information. Now in the mind of the majority, all of these implied rights came together to form a sort of Marvel Cinematic Universe of privacy rights. It was especially buttressed by the fact that the Ninth Amendment explicitly laid at the fact that, hey guys, the first eight amendments are good and all, but if we forgot to mention any rights, well, don't feel constricted by what we wrote down. Let us know your favorite rights in the comments. Now the consensus was probably a bit less definitive than some of you might hope. No fundamental right to contraception was drawn up. Instead, the real innovation here was the idea that let's give people their privacy, keep the handcuffs out of the bedroom, unless. Now the innovation to actually be specific was in the way that the Supreme Court applied established standards. A governmental purpose to control or prevent activities constitutionally subject to state regulation may not be achieved by means which sweep unnecessarily broadly and thereby invalidate areas of protected freedom. Now they ruled that a right to privacy was a protected freedom that would have been violated by this ban on using contraception. In doing so, the court manufactured a new right to privacy into precedent. The law, in forbidding the use of contraceptives rather than regulating their manufacture or sale, sought to achieve its goals by means of having a maximum destructive impact upon privacy. Now this majority decision played a key role in outlawing bans on all sorts of things that you'd have to violate someone's privacy to know are happening, from anti-sodomy laws to paring back abortion restrictions and legalizing gay marriages. If you thought originalists hated Roe v. Wade, well this case is the final boss battle for them. Now before we go, let me give you guys a view into the alternate reality where the dissenting opinion won. The two dissenting justices had very specific issues with this new judicial invention of a right to privacy. They conceded that, alright sure, each individually cited amendment implies a certain privacy right, but you can't just wrap up all these individually implied freedoms into a bundle and present it as a new freedom of privacy. They found that no single amendment in the constitution really protected what was going on here. For example, they wrote, had the defendant here been convicted for doing nothing more than expressing opinions to persons coming to the clinic, or for telling people how devices could be used, I can think of no reasons why their expressions of views would not be protected by the 1st and 14th amendments, which guarantee freedom of speech. Of course, today's case is not really a freedom of speech case. In fact, the crime is one of conduct in their opinion, specifically providing the contraception that would be used in the future crime of protected sex. These defendants admittedly engaged with others in a planned course of conduct to help people violate the Connecticut law. Merely because some speech was used in carrying on that conduct, we are not justified in holding that the First Amendment forbids the state to punish their conduct. Now in the mind of the dissent, claiming the First Amendment specifically protected the doctors in this case would kind of feel like claiming that the First Amendment protected a drug dealer. 
No, no, no. I spoke as I was selling him the weed, so I'm being prosecuted for my speech. Still, alright, don't think the First Amendment covers it. Well, pick another card. We got plenty of them where that one came from. How about that Fourth Amendment's protection against unreasonable search and seizure? All feels a little unreasonable, right? Well, okay, did Connecticut unlawfully search private property or seize anything? No, they simply passed a law banning the use of contraceptives that would be nearly impossible to enforce. Sure, the state's regulation entirely revolves around activities committed in one's private lives, but in the dissenting opinion's mind, your private life is fair game for state regulation. In their mind, states could stick up a condom limit sign right next to the speed limit sign, but they couldn't make drivers pick up a police officer to monitor that speedometer or put an investigator in the bedroom. Now the failed dissent summed itself up by saying, For these reasons, I get nowhere in this case by talking about a constitutional right of privacy as an emanation from one or more constitutional provisions. I like my privacy as much as the next guy, but I am nevertheless compelled to admit that the government has a right to invade it unless prohibited by some specific constitutional provision. So that's the case of Griswold v Connecticut and how Americans got basic privacy rights. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, sorry it took me a little longer than normal to write this episode, but I wanted to cross all my T's and dot all my I's before I click that publish button. Now I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the courts, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.